Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, it's wonderful to see so many people here early on a Sunday morning. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for the Constance Holden Memorial Address, Dr. Alice Dreger. Uh, Constance Holden, you may know, uh, before her tragic death a few years ago, uh, was widely recognized as one of the best science journalists we have, and uh, in fact was termed by the APS Observer the Dean of Behavioral Science Writers. Uh, Dr. Dreger uh, is an academic historian and sex researcher who obtained her PhD from Indiana University. And on the academic side, she has worked at Michigan State and Northwestern. And on the social side, she's been uh, an activist and patient advocate. Uh, Dr. Dreger is the author of a book that you should all read, just came out recently, uh, Galileo's Third Finger. I, I heartily recommend it to all of you. Uh, one theme of the book that is uh, I, uh, one that I think is sure to resonate with this, with this group is uh, the peaceful coexistence of good science and social activism. Dr. Dreger, thank you so much for coming. Okay, thank you all for having me. And it's a real privilege to uh, speak in Constant Holzen's name. She was, as you know, an outstanding journalist and a real loss when she died uh, to the science journalism profession and to science itself because she really was somebody who bothered to really understand what she was reporting on. And I'll talk some about that today. As a historian of medicine and historian of science, I'm not sure I followed all of your papers <laughs> that I was listening to the last few days, but I will tell you it's fun to think about how far intelligence research has come since the beginning of history of medicine when uh, Galen posited that there were four humors in the body and the brain was made of phlegm. <laughs> As you may recall, if you know the humoral theory, in addition to the brain being made of phlegm, so was semen, so was breast milk, so was mucus. So the notion was that if you uh, had too much in one part of the body, you might not have enough in the other. <clears throat> and I remember distinctly in graduate school reading a history of anatomy text, which was about a, a dissection in the Renaissance, and they reported having opened the body of a very lecherous man and founding his cranium largely empty. <laughs> And uh, I thought about this again, actually, when I was breastfeeding my own son, the Galenic theory of phlegm about the brain and breast milk being related to each other, because I swear that the more breast milk I put into that kid, the more sleep deprived I came, the more stupid I became. <laughs> I was convinced I was giving him my brain. Um, so today I'm going to draw a little bit from my book, which is actually called Galileo's Middle Finger. I guess Ron couldn't bring himself to say the word middle. <laughs> he called it Galileo's Third Finger. Uh, and I can tell you later uh, if you're interested in why the book is called that. But basically, through the book, what I try to do is figure out what exactly happens when activists and scientists clash. And you can imagine that the kind of work you do puts you vulnerable to this kind of work. The reason I came to this is actually was with the assistance of Steve Pinker, who spoke last night. And his talk is sort of perfect for what I'm going to tell you about, because he talked about how to write. I'm going to talk about why to write. Um, when I was sort of retiring from intersex activism in 2006. I took on a history of a book controversy, which was the book by J. Michael Bailey from Northwestern University, which was partly about transsexualism. And I thought that that was going to be a he said, she said kind of story. And it turns out that, in fact, what she said was not true. So the activists had come after Bailey and put against him charges that were ethical charges that were false. And when I documented that after a year of research, they came after me. <laughs> And it was quite a miserable experience. Uh, but one bright spot in it was that Steve actually had read the paper and wrote to me, it's so well written, <laughs> which I thought was funny as a compliment for somebody on your research. But he offered me an introduction to his agent. And because these people were coming after me so hard, I said, actually, what I would love is a letter for a Guggenheim Fellowship, because I need to shore up my academic credentials as they destroy me online, which is what they were doing. Uh, so he did give me a letter, along with several other folks. And I got a Guggenheim to do this work which involved traveling the country, talking to scientists who had been attacked by activists to try to find out what had happened to them, how they survived, what things they did that were right, what things they did that were wrong. So I'll tell you a little bit about that today, but mostly I want to focus on kind of a how-to. How can you protect yourself and advocate for yourself within the media system? So one of the stories I talk about in Galileo's Middle Finger is you may be familiar with what happened to Napoleon Chagnon and the late James Neal's reputation when Patrick Tierney's book came out. Tierney is a self-styled journalist and wrote this book with the assistance of some cultural anthropologists who hated what Chagnon had to say because Chagnon pr uh, put forth a lot of sociobiological ideas, a lot of notions, for example, about fitness and violence that they found highly objectionable. And so this book, among other claims, made the, the claim in the first version 
that Neil had come into the field, Neil was a geneticist, a very important geneticist, had come into the field with a vaccine for measles that he knew was a bad vaccine and might cause measles, that in fact the vaccine had caused a measles outbreak, and that when the measles outbreak occurred among the Yanomama people, Neil withheld treatment to see who would live and who would die, that this was a eugenics experiment. In fact, this was entirely false. Uh, the vaccine was a good vaccine. Neil was bringing the vaccine into the field because he knew measles was inevitable. And in fact, there's documentation that the measles outbreak occurred before he arrived. And he and the other people in the party, including Chagnon, tried to race ahead and vaccinate ahead. But this became a, a highly problematic situation in the early 2000s because the American Anthropological Association decided to do essentially a persecution of Chagnon. And the work I did in my book, I uncovered internal documentation that showed that they knew that Tierney's book was a house of cards, but they basically went after Chagnon anyway in order to sort of prove that they cared about indigenous peoples. And to have a national, international academic society do this is, to my mind, extremely disturbing. Because academic societies, while maybe they shouldn't weigh in on politics, should certainly weigh in on the freedom of research and on the accuracy of representations of our colleagues' research. And so this was extremely upsetting. So I talk about these kinds of things in the book, and I just <laughs> want to tell you really briefly about one of the headlines that emerged from Tierney's book and tell you the kind of damage these, a, a problematic news representation can have. This was in The Guardian, and the title was, Scientists Killed Amazon Indians to Test Race Theory. Now, there's quotation marks, right, meant to say, well, somebody said that, we're not saying that. But of course, most readers, the quotation marks would be meaningless to them. And this basically simply reproduced what Tierney had said with the support of the cultural anthropologist who had assisted him. This, this uh, article in The Guardian took off, basically painted Neil and Chagnon as eugenicists who had attempted basically a genocide. And so it was extremely damaging. And I'll just tell you a little anecdote of how bad these things can be. Recently, this article, 10 years later, went live again by anti-vaccination people who decided to throw it back out there again and prove that vaccines have been used for things like eugenics and genocide. And it got sent around as if it was not 10 years old. It bloomed all over Facebook all over again. And I was having to write to explain to people. I actually wrote to The Guardian and asked them to retract the piece, but they never answered me, which is pretty typical. So it's really important for the sake of science, but also for the sake of the people out there who are affected by your science, that we try to get journalists to get things right. A happier story that I tell in the book is the story of Chuck Roselli. Chuck may not think it's a happy story, but I think it turned out happily. He's a neuroscience researcher at OHSU in Portland, and he was studying uh, male homosexuality in rams. So looking at, for agricultural purposes and also for scientific purposes, why is it that some rams uh, very clearly preferentially refer, prefer sex with other males? And what happened was PETA, the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, got a hold of this and decided to claim that he was, in fact, doing a gay eugenics program where he was trying to figure out how to prevent homosexuality in the human population. And they convinced the gay and lesbian rights movement that this is, in fact, what was going on. So you ended up with bizarre headlines like, scientists look to straighten homosexual sheep. <laughs> Martina Navratilova, who is both an animal rights activist and a gay rights activist, came after Roselli sort of personally. It must be very strange to have an international tennis star come after you as a researcher. Uh, Roselli's university president got about 20,000 emails calling for his firing. Imagine if today, this, this was almost 10 years ago now, but imagine if, well, not quite 10 years ago, imagine if today your university professor or your university president got 20,000 emails calling for your firing. So why is this a happy story? Well, the happy story is that Roselli was assigned a media relations person at OHSU, a man named Jim Newman. And Newman was absolutely tireless and relentless in how he fought back. And what he did was set up an auto-response to everybody writing that actually provided links to correct information about Roselli's research that Newman had written in plain language. He also then, if anybody further wrote back, engaged them personally. He also, when Roselli became exhausted trying to do all the media that was being asked of him, Jim Newman took over and learned Roselli's research well enough to speak about it on the radio and the television for him so that he was constantly having a personal advocate representative. And he turned the whole thing around. In fact, he got several members of the gay and lesbian rights movement to get angry at PETA for having misrepresented what Roselli's work really was. So it is possible if you work with good people within your institutions who know how to manage the media to sometimes have allies within your own institution who will fight really effectively. So my own work, I'll tell you, has been uh, in patient advocacy. And most of my patient advocacy has focused on what happens to people called, 
alternatively, people born with differences of sex development or with intersex, what in the 19th century were called hermaphrodites, people with sex development anomalies. And um, in my own work, I've tried to defend the rights of those folks in the medical sphere, both as patients but also as research subjects. And a couple years ago, while I was still working on the book, I ended up dealing with a case of research subject abuse. I don't have time to go into it all, but a researcher was using prenatal dexamethasone, so a steroid glucocorticoid, starting in the first trimester with mothers at risk of having a child with congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which has an increased risk of intersex in the, the females and the daughters, or I should say the genetic um, daughters, <clears throat> and was doing a sort of bait and switch. She was telling the parents that this had been found safe and effective while getting NIH funding to find out if it was safe and effective, and using the same families retrospectively to see if it was true that it had been safe. So they were brought into this system, told this was just a clinical intervention, given a glucocorticoid in the first trimester known to cross the placental barrier, meant to cross the placental barrier. As it turns out, the brain studies coming out of this are kind of terrifying um, and should have been, in fact, tested in animals first in terms of an animal model, but never was. This was put into practice after an N of 1 trial clinically with no placebo control. There's never been, shockingly, a control, placebo control trial on this, and it's been used now in thousands and thousands of families. <clears throat> so when I was putting this work out there, I was having to explain, as you can imagine, I just explained to you all what may have run past some of you just because this isn't your field, a lot of highly technical information that required a lot of nuance. And I was working with one reporter at Slate who actually did a really awesome job in terms of laying out what happened. But uh, she was being really careful. That never guarantees you that their editor will be very careful. And you rarely talk to the editor. And so in this case, one of the things we were talking about was that the, the females are sometimes born with ambiguous genitalia, which means sometimes they're born with a large clitoris. And this was the headline that ended up coming out in Slate. If your baby girl might be born with a small penis. <laughs> Right, which was incredibly unhelpful because you could have said if your baby bo girl might be born with a large clitoris and then it might seem less sort of sensationalistic and less horrifying. But of course, what person wouldn't have this sort of gut level reaction? I'll do anything. And this was in fact this piece about um, this prenatal treatment. Like I said, the article itself was really good. The, the reporter was excellent, did a huge amount of work, really did a great job. But this is part of the reason why I've tended in my own work to try to represent my own work within science journalism to the extent possible. And so, for example, when I then found out that um, IVF physicians were giving dexamethasone out of a theory it prevents miscarriage, which, by the way, absolutely no evidence it does, all the same risks as in this other population, I ended up writing, for example, a piece for The Atlantic, which was much less annoying in terms of the headline, IVF on steroids, the dangerous off-label use of dex during pregnancy. So I realize a lot of you are not going to become science journalists, but I want to encourage you to recognize that when you're working with journalists, there's a high risk factor, and yet not working them with them also has a high risk factor because they may miss your work, as Steve talked about yesterday, they may misrepresent your work, or they may show one side but not the side that you've actually done the research on. So it's really important to work with science journalists. And in this work, I've ended up being on both sides, so I'm able to be a kind of translator. I'm sympathetic to journalists, good journalists, and I'm sympathetic to good researchers. And it is in my interest to try to get you to understand each other. So that's pretty much what the rest of this talk will be about, is how to understand each other. So first I'm going to talk about how science journalism has changed in the last, say, 40 years. And that relates to more generally how journalism has changed. Science journalism isn't special in that way. Secondly, trying to help you understand the reality that science journalists face. And finally, the biggest part of this talk, how you can protect and advocate for yourself within media. Okay, so first, how science journalism has changed. If we think about journalism, a lot of people tend to think about Watergate as the classic journalistic moment, right? They think about all the president's men, they think of Woodward and Bernstein. And that is something that inspired a lot of people to go into journalism. It is incredibly important investigative journalism, incredibly brave, smart, difficult work, um, that took a huge amount of guts and paid off in the sense that the American people came to know what was really going on within the Nixon administration. But that's not the reality we have today. When the Woodward and Bernstein and the Washington Post were doing the work on Watergate, they were existing in a world where people still purchased paper newspapers and where it would have been difficult for the New York Times to play catch-up, although they did and they sometimes got ahead of the Washington Post. What ended up happening was a very productive, competitive attitude among papers because if you could get ahead on a bit of the story, then you could sell the papers. And because people literally bought newspapers, bought the New York Times in LA, in Chicago, wherever, 
there was a direct economic feedback into the system for good investigative journalism. And so how has it changed? Well, today what we have is internet economics that have harmed journalism, especially investigative journalism. Why? Because everybody assumes their news should come for free. They even get irritated if there are ads. They're simply not interested in having to pay for anything that's behind a firewall. And they won't do it. And why should they do it? Because if the New York Times or the Washington Post publishes a really important piece of investigative journalism, two hours later, Slate and the Chicago Tribune and everybody else will summarize it for you and post it for free so that you go to their site because it's free and you'll see their ads instead of the other ads. So what's happened is a system that is extremely damaging to journalism as we've known it. That's not to say there aren't compensatory mechanisms coming in. There are groups like ProPublica, which is a nonprofit investigative journalism um, organization that tries to make up for this gap through philanthropy, basically, and then funding of journalism. But right now, we're in a very dangerous situation where the system of the press, as it was conceived by the Founding Fathers and as it has existed for many years, is actually very economically endangered. And the consequence of that is you get people who are frankly not as good able to stay in the business. There are some people who are terrific and have remained in the business. But for some people, the system simply couldn't hold as many science journalists as it used to hold. And they've dropped out of the system. And often it's the talented ones who drop out because they can do other kinds of work. And so you get a brain drain from journalism. And we've seen a brain drain. That's not to say there aren't a lot of good journalists left. There are. But they are under tremendous problems. Today, because of the internet, news travels much faster, and it also disappears faster. And that means that things are going by at a very fast rate. The, the sad consequence of that is errors replicate faster, and they last longer. <laughs> because what happens is the error gets replicated before you can get a correction run in the newspaper, right? What's nice about the internet is you can run a correction right away because it's online. With the paper system, you had to run it a day later or two days later. But the problem is the other people writing on the story will pick up the same errors over and over and over again. And because then people will come back and search for that story, they're going to find that error again and again unless it gets corrected in every instantiation. And I've seen this happen in various fields where a single error has been reproduced and through a telephone game made worse over time. So this is a real problem for science in particular. News and opinion today are often shamelessly blurred. In the past, journalists had a really strict idea, usually, of what counted as reporting news versus what counted as an op-ed. But today, you very often find a blending of these two things coming together in a sort of way that I find shameless. So I get really annoyed, personally, when I'm interviewed by somebody about my research. And then what I end up finding is that they've essentially written an op-ed piece that sort of looks like news, but is kind of op-ed. And how is the average reader supposed to make sense of what's supposed to be factual why even bother fact-checking such a thing, right? Because you've got this bizarre blending of sort of this is what I think, this is what the person said, and you're not even pretending to attempt any kind of objectivity in that case. Obviously, perfect objectivity is impossible, but it's good if we aim for it as scientists, as writers of nonfiction. And then you've got the phenomenon that you all are aware of, of blogs and tweets and podcasts, which are very influential, sometimes more influential than good journalists. And so you've got a situation where a very good journalist will write about your work, but a much more influential pundit will write about it and twist it and turn it, and that's the one that makes it into the popular media. So that can be extremely frustrating. It's also the case that some journalists today do blogging and tweeting and podcasts, and so you get a situation where they can start reporting on stuff that you've just said faster than the normal checks and balances system will uh, occur. Good journalists don't, don't make that kind of mistake, but because social media moves so fast and journalists are rewarded by attention coming to them, they have a sort of built-in interest in getting stuff out there into social media as much as possible. So that's kind of how science journalism has changed. What I mean to tell you is it's a very dangerous environment for scientists whose research is being represented because there are not good checks and balances system, because there are not enough good uh, science journalists. Newspapers tend not to spend a lot of money on science journalism because it's not something usually that gets a lot of clicks. Health journalism, yes. So if the work you're doing can be interpreted as some health issue, it's more likely to be covered. But it can be quite frustrating to see the underfunding of these systems. So secondly, let's talk about understanding science journalists' reality. Um, this is a fabulous article that just came out in The Guardian. It's a satire piece, actually, uh, by Martin Robbins, and it came out this week, so I couldn't think the timing was better. This, this, <laughs> he wrote a piece called, This is a News Website Article About a Scientific Paper. And what he does is go through exactly what a scientific article looks like, 
and just writes it as if it was the article, but he's just writing what the article is. So it begins in the stand first, which is in the US what we call um, the deck. That's the little blurb at the beginning. I will make a fairly obvious pun about the subject matter before posing an inane question I have no intention of really answering. Is this an important scientific finding? <laughs> And then he goes on to go through all the steps. I'm not going to give you all of them. They're really, really funny. He says, in this paragraph, I will state the main claim that the research makers making appropriate use of scare quotes to ensure that it's clear that I have no opinion about this research whatsoever. In this paragraph, I will briefly, because no paragraph should be more than one line, state which existing scientific ideas this new research challenges. If, if the research is about a potential cure or a solution to a problem, this paragraph will describe how it will raise hopes for a group of sufferers. Right. This paragraph elaborates on the claim about adding weasel words like the scientists say to shift responsibility for establishing the likely truth or accuracy of the research findings on to absolutely anybody but me, the journalist. Don't make me look it up. I'm just going to say scientist A says this, scientist B says this. In this paragraph, I will state in which journal the research will be published. I'll just skip this one. And then on the bottom, he has a quote from somebody saying, basically, this is a soundbite, the scientist will say, from a department and university that I will give brief credit to. The existing science is a bit dodgy, whereas my conclusion is bang on. <laughs> right? And it goes through, it says, next there'll be an insertion of a picture because nobody can read an article longer than 450 words before they reach a picture. He goes through and it's exactly, in fact, the template of what you find in science journalism over and over again. And we can be snarky about it, but why is it that science journalists often write like this? Well, one reason is that they're under-resourced, as I've already mentioned. They're short on time and short on money. When I started doing my work 20 years ago, it was not uncommon for a journalist to spend several weeks on a story that I was participating in. And they would be able to interview lots and lots of people, many of whom would only be background folks, but they would interview lots, they would read, they would come back to me several times and say, well, I read that paper you recommended, but now I don't understand this part of it. We would go back and forth. It would be tremendous. They would send out a real photographer to go take a real picture of the person that they were writing about. Today, what ends up happening, typically, is they have a couple of hours at the most. That's all they're allowed by their editors because of the economic system. And that makes it very difficult to do anything other than sort of slotted in journalism. They're also under editorial control. They're not under the kind of control you think you are with editorial control. Yes, you have to get your papers into journals, and that can be difficult. But editors in newspapers can change your work without really asking you. And I've experienced this. In fact, there are several venues I've stopped writing for because they changed my work without a check back. Sometimes horribly, sometimes to the point where like I'm screaming and going, oh my god, they said exactly the opposite of what I was saying because they changed the wording in the paragraph. So journalists are under editorial control and often don't have as much control as you would like them to have with regard to how they can report the story. They are, for example, often required to keep the article shorter than 800 words. Imagine how much you can possibly say in 800 words. Almost nothing if it's a complicated story. So it's quite frustrating in that way. In journalism, readbacks are considered a no-no. What a readback is is if you talk to somebody and you ask them to call you back and read to you the part that they're going to quote to make sure that they actually got it right, that they're not truncated in a way that uh, deceives somebody as to what you were actually saying. The reason this comes is because of an idea of objectivity where you're not supposed to cooperate with the source. And a readback by some journalists is considered uh, cooperating with the source because you're telling them how you're going to use their work. And so they often will tell you that they won't give you readbacks. And I'll tell you what to do in that circumstance. Then there's the balance fetish that you probably know about, right? The idea that if we talk about this, we have to talk about somebody who thinks it's wrong. And this is how you end up with idiotic articles for many years that finally stopped on evolution. When any, anybody talked about evolution, a creationist had to be quoted. When anybody talked about vaccines, an anti-vaccine person would have to be quoted. When anybody talked about climate science, you had to have somebody being skeptical that the climate was changing. And so you still find occasionally, although not among the best journalists, this sort of balance fetish that is the idea that we have to always have an opposing voice, even if the opposing voice is one out of 10,000. And you know, most of the scientists, in fact, agree on something. And then today, for journalists, what is rewarded is clicks, not accuracy or subtlety per se. A journalist may get in trouble with his or her editor if they are inaccurate and a source complains. So they may get in trouble. But that's rare that a source bothers to complain and rare that the editor even responds to you if you do make a complaint. What they get rewarded on is how many times people clicked on the article. Well, think to yourself, what's going to drive them, right, in terms of that? What's going to drive them is sexy quotes, sexy topics, the sort of thing that creates controversy, using a big name. So they'll go to the same big names over and over and over again, right? Because if you go to 
Art Kaplan in bioethics, or you go to, say, Richard Dawkins in evolution, or whomever it is, you're going to get clicks automatically because it mentions somebody people know. It's kind of celebrity science in that way, and it's problematic, as we all know, for research. So we've talked about how science journalism has changed, understanding science journalists' reality. Now I'm going to give you the real take-home message, which is the big part of the talk. How can you protect and advocate for yourself? Um, just to start off, I want to, you know, tell you the story of Galileo's middle finger and how he did it wrong. <laughs> Galileo did not do media relations correctly, <laughs> and he paid for it. Um, you may know that, that when Galileo died, he was out of favor with the church. The church had decided he was wrong, and he was actually put under house arrest. He was at risk for torture, um, actually, and at risk for even more. His contemporary Giordano Bruno was actually burned at the stake for putting forth dangerous ideas, or so perceived dangerous ideas about the universe. So Galileo was really in a bad situation. When he died, he was buried in a very plain grave because he was a sort of a nobody. Um, or no, he was not a nobody by any means, but what he was was out of favor. And a hundred years later, the uh, people who were thinking about science and the folks in Italy all recognized that, in fact, he was right. He was a genius. He was a national hero. He was a scientific hero. And so they ended up moving him to a much fancier grave in the... Uh, cathedral, the Basilica di Santa Croce, and when they did that, one of his devotees chopped off several of his fingers to sort of make relics out of them. <laughs> this may sound bizarre, but this is what you did with saints, and Galileo was famous, and so you would keep body parts of people, believe it or not, as sort of um, wonderful things. So th this particular devotee put it into this glass jar and put it on a beautiful alabaster plinth and had this wonderful uh, saying put around it about how he was such a genius and pointed to the skies. <laughs> Well, when I came upon this in graduate school, this cracked me up completely because, of course, I knew the story of Galileo and the idea that what would be left of him is him flipping the universe a bird eternally struck me as the ultimate story of the scientist who was right, but only after his death found out to be right. This is not what you want. He got a very nice tomb out of it, but what you want is not, in fact, a hundred years after your death to be understood and vindicated. What you want is actually during your lifetime, during real time, to be understood. So what can you do to protect yourself in that way? Um, well, you can avoid the sorts of things Galileo did, which was sort of um, bait your enemies if they're extremely powerful, but also try to think about representation. So let's talk some about how to, how to protect yourself without giving up your integrity, because I'm not interested in asking you to give up your integrity in order to avoid risk. In fact, I want to make clear, I want you to keep doing risky, dangerous work. I think it's incredibly important for science, but also for democracy, if we're going to have social policy that actually is sustainable and functions and doesn't waste money and doesn't hurt people, it requires science. It requires evidence-based approaches to the world that actually tell us what is true. You cannot build a good 20-story building if you don't know the reality of engineering, right? If you don't know the reality of the soil, the reality of the, the steel that you're using, the same is true in social policy, that we cannot have good, sensible, economically sensible, and sustainable and safe public policy if what it's based on is bad science. So I think it's important that you do risky work for your own sake because I think risky work is good for humanity, but it's also very specifically important in a democracy like our own. So first of all, I'm going to say, as I would in medicine were I a physician, that to protect yourself from a disease, you should begin by knowing your risk factors. <laughs> and these are the risk factors for scientists, I would say, having studied how they get in trouble, when they get in trouble, and you'll recognize some of these, I'm afraid. I should say before I give you this list, if this was the list of being at risk for cancer, you would all be very depressed at the end of this. <laughs> Study humans, especially identity issues. So if you're studying human population, but particularly if you're studying anything that people interpret as being a claim about their identity, you're going to have a much harder time in terms of people pushing back at you. Uh, study sexuality, sex, gender, race, or any hot, other hot button issue. I would add intelligence into that, especially when it intersects with these other things. You're going to end up attracting more anger. If you fail to fit into simple polarized camps, so one of the things that journalists will tell me sometimes, it drives me up the wall, is we're working on the following six domains. Does any of your research fit into this domain? So we're working on climate science, and we're working on cancer, and working on this. And even if you have a really important story and it doesn't fit into those domains that the editors are interested in covering right now, you're not going to get covered. But worse than that is when they're covering, you're, they're covering you because it is a domain they cover, but they've decided that there's two sides of this debate, 
and you don't fit into it, you're going to be fit into one of the two of them. And I document this in my book about how it is that various scientists who were saying a third way of something got slotted into the evil way because the third way was too hard to comprehend. And so people get slotted into, for example, you're either pro-civil rights or you're racist. And there, there's very two very simplistic approaches to that. And if you're talking about race at all, you must fit into one of those camps and your research must be saying that either, it must be revealing about you that you were either one or the other. It must reveal that about you. So that can be very frustrating. Now again, to credit journalists and editors, the reason they focus on particular domains and track stories along particular ways is because that can be a strength for them. It can be a strength of bringing it to their reader, but it can really drive you crazy if you don't fit into those categories. If you lack oppressed identity cards, by that if, I mean if you can't hold up a card saying you're a woman, you're an LGBT person, you're a person of color, you're a disabled person, whatever it is, if you lack those cards, people will say you're more likely to be evil. I think this is a stupid way to face the world personally, but I've seen it happen over and over and over again. So it's the way scientists get judged, and it's something to be aware of. And then, uh, as I experienced myself when I resigned from Northwestern a couple weeks ago for being told I was off-brand um, in my research, if you're in a brand-obsessed identity, uh, brand-obsessed university, you're definitely at risk because your university administration is terribly worried about you staying on message. And to my mind, academic freedom is exactly the opposite of a brand. Brands are all about staying on message. Academic freedom is about the right to be completely off-message. But if you find yourself in an institution maybe not even a university, in my case, partly a problem with being within a hospital medical school, you can definitely end up in this problem where they think that you are uh, too dangerous and they will make remarkable moves. In my case, literal censorship, published work that was withdrawn by my dean against my will because he was afraid of offending the hospital brand. Uh, so how can you protect and advocate for yourself? The first thing is check your work. I cannot emphasize this enough. Researchers the world over, not just in the sciences, are lazy about checking their work. And this appalls me. I know why we do it. It's because we're moving fast. Everything's moving faster. But it's also because we're not trained in graduate school how to check our work. I had to train myself on how to do specific fact checking. I do line by line by line fact checking of my own work, even if I think it's true. Even if I'm writing that the Declaration of Independence was signed in 1776, I look it up one more time before I publish because I check everything I'm publishing if it's something like this book or a major research article. If you don't check your work, that makes it very possible for people to see you as a lousy researcher. If it's so bad that you end up with something like corrections and retractions, you can imagine how much it's going to undermine your work, even if your work is pretty good. So please consider seriously checking your work before you publish it. Don't expect your reviewers to do that. Do it yourself and train your graduate students how to do it understand the reality of science journalists. We've talked about that, but in order to do that, that means, for example, treating journalists like humans, be nice and expect them to be self-interested. <laughs> See them as human. Be polite to them. Learn their name. When they call, use their name. Send a thank you note afterwards saying, thanks for interviewing me today. Let me know if you have any follow-up questions. If they do a good job on the article, send them a note saying, that was really great. I'm sharing it with people in my field. Reward them, gently punish them when they do things wrong, and expect them, in fact, to have self-interest. If you're very nasty to them, they will be nasty back to you much of the time. So keep that in mind and try to focus on how you can interact with them in a way that will understand their own reality. Know your journal publication is inadequate to the task before you, which is if you want to bring your work to a public audience, and if somebody else is doing it for you and you don't, maybe don't want it, but it's happening, you have to know that publishing a journal publication is not enough to represent your work. And so one of the things I do, for example, in my own work is do media advisories on my own website. And what I do is create FAQs. If there's a big hot story coming and I know I'm going to get called or it's likely I'm going to get called or I've got a big paper coming out and I think I'm likely to be called, what I do is create a very clear FAQ. And this is incredibly useful. I'll just give you one example, one that I did when... Uh, sex verification in sports was big a few years ago and it came back around actually and I had to update it. Um, but basically things like why shouldn't you use the word hermaphrodite? What are examples of these conditions? How can somebody be raised as a girl but turn out to have testes? These kinds of questions where I'm saying in plain language. The reason I do this is most journalists are only going to call me for a few minutes and they're not going to understand a lot of what I'm saying because it's going to go by fast, especially if it's an esoteric field like intersex. I mean it's really pretty hard to explain it. 
So what I do is create these FAQs. I did this for my resignation too, for example. Why did you resign? Where is your resignation letter? What is the information about where I can see the thing that was censored? Uh, how did your university respond? I put it all out there so that journalists can actually get it right. And then I update it as stories go out there if I see an error beginning to happen. So for example, one of the errors with my resignation news was that one journalist said the dean was interested in censoring part of this article. That wasn't true. It was the whole article he wanted to censor. So I put up a media advisory, journalists, please note, there's been an error in the reporting, and please get this right. And when you do this, this makes it a lot easier for journalists to be prepared when they call you to ask you something more interesting. It also means that without having to call you again, they can go back and check and make sure they got something right. It also sometimes means if you're in a media frenzy, you'll actually have reporters accurately report your stuff without ever calling you. This happened to me with the sex verification thing. When this was a big hot, this, this comes around every two years or so, but when it was big and hot because of Castor Semenya, what happened was somebody called me and said, I really like that piece in USA Today that quoted you. And I said, I didn't talk to USA Today this week. Like, what's that? And so I looked, and in fact, USA Today had specifically quoted my blog, at my FAQ. And they got it right because they quoted it. So this is a very important thing to do. And if you're not sure how to write plainly about your own work, try to find somebody who can assist you in doing this because it's incredibly useful. It also forces you to sort of get down to sound bites and put in plain language what it is you really want them to understand about your work. So in addition to that, you can post the media advisories, you can update the media advisories, and you can uh, also write your own press releases, but I would say have a pro edit them. If you're not somebody like me who's been writing press releases for 20 years, you really want to have a pro. I, I don't really like press releases. I find them kind of sickening where research is concerned because it feels like weird marketing. But that said, journalists still look for press releases if there's an interesting topic coming out. And so within your own institutions, chances are there are public relations people who can assist you in doing these. And working with them is very useful because going back and forth, you do again have to figure out how do I say what I really need to say? What's the main point I want to make? And how do I say it in a way that I won't be misunderstood? Working back and forth iteratively on a press release draft will get you, help you get to that sentence, get to those two lines that will help you be accurately represented. Get real media training. At most of your institutions, you'll have PR people who actually can give you media training. What is media training? Well, go and ask them, and they'll show you. I did it 20 years ago. It made a huge difference for me, because I was doing lots and lots of media, and I still do lots of television. I do lots of radio. What it basically is is a way to help you understand the way the interview is going to go and helps you practice. To this, well, until I resigned, to, until a month ago, it was still the case that if a big story was coming out, I asked one particular person in Northwestern Media Relations, who I got along with very well, to sometimes get on the phone with me and do a practice interview. And she would ask me the questions, and I would start answering, and I'd say, no, that wasn't good, and I'd do it again. And we'd do it back and forth and back and forth. By the time a real journalist called me, I was ready, and almost invariably, she had nailed what questions they were going to ask me. She understood what questions they were going to be asking. So that was incredibly useful to me, and it meant that I was on when the journalist called. And it wasn't that the first three interviews were practice, because the first three interviews could be disastrous by the time you get to the fourth. If you're talking to a journalist on the phone, ask for a readback while you're on the phone. They'll almost never do it later, but they will frequently be willing to do it while you're on the phone. So they'll say to you, this is what you said, and you can then sometimes say, no, 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 I meant this, and please get it this way because I don't want to be inaccurate. And so you can do that with many of them, and many of them will allow you to do that. You can also ask to answer questions by email. If you're nervous about talking to a particular reporter, one of the things you can do is say, I'm really frantic right now because there's a lot of attention on this. Would you mind sending me five questions, and I'll be happy to answer them? And then don't answer them hugely longly, right? <laughs> answer them clearly and briefly to make sure that the main thing you want to get across is going to get across. How else can you protect and advocate to, for yourself? Specifically speak to the naturalistic fallacy. You all know what it is? Philosophers call it this. It is the belief that people have that when you describe what is, you're saying what ought to be. So if, for example, in intelligence research, you say, say you were to say that breastfeeding turns out to lower IQ by 10 points, people would think you're saying that means you shouldn't breastfeed, right? Because what is is what ought to be. In your work, I would say very specifically say to journalists, I'm describing what is. I'm not proposing a social policy based on this. I'm not saying we should take what I found and change the whole system. I'm saying I found something descriptively interesting that could have policy implications, but I'm describing something. Try very specifically to get them away from the naturalistic fallacy where they think 
that what it is you're saying in terms of describing the world is you saying this is how I believe the world should be. So for example, if you say people in poverty have lower uh, intelligence, they may be thinking you're saying people in poverty should not be respected because they have lower intelligence, right? What you want to do is make very clear you're doing a descriptive kind of work and you're not saying you're advocating for that being the way the world should work. So speak very specifically to that. Ask for corrections if they are important in an article. Don't annoy journalists by needling them with little tiny corrections, but if there is an important correction to be made, hop on right away and tell them how to correct it. Don't just say, you got this wrong, there's this and this and this and this. Say, you wrote it this way, an accurate way to say it would be this way. And they're, they're much more likely, in fact, then to hop on and do the correction. Follow up with thanks when journalists do a good job, or even if they do a mediocre job, because it helps them understand when they're doing good, but it also helps build a relationship. And speaking to that, maintain relationships with journalists, because then when something comes out, if they call you, you have something of a relationship already existing. And you all know about the issue of why having a relationship ends up getting you a better representation on the other end. So it is important, for example, to me, when I'm working with lots of good science journalists, to feed them interesting work by other people if I think it's up their alley. And the reason I do that is because it keeps the line of communication open. It shows that I respect them as a journalist, that I think they might be interested in a topic. They appreciate hearing from me. So I'll sometimes say, hey, so-and-so has this interesting paper coming out, and I think you'd be interested in it. And you might also talk to so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so because they're also working in this field, and they're also doing interesting stuff. I don't send long messages. I don't expect a response. I always say, you don't need to respond. So I'm not wasting their time. But having relationships and keeping those relationships open help create positive communication lines. And then I want to propose to you an idea I had a few years ago, and I just don't have the funding or the time to do this because I'm working on too many things. But I really think it is time, and when I mentioned this to some science journalists, by the way, they, it struck fear in their hearts, which I think is not a bad thing. I think it's time for I actually use social media to do what I would call rate my journalist, right? So we rate our restaurants, we rate our hotels, we rate our airlines. I think it may be time, in a very open, honest, respectful way, for scientists to come together, maybe through the AAAS, and create an online system where people who are actually mentioned in a story get to say whether or not they were accurately represented in the story and to rate how well the journalist did. By name, it would not be anonymous, so you would be responsible for your own um, words. Now, if you did something like this, journalists might also discover that you tend to rate them low and they might not be interested in calling you or that you may, I suppose, inflate them. But I think that this could be very positive if what happened is we had an open system whereby we talked with each other about which journalists are trustworthy in terms of accurate representations. I've done this at the low level with scientists who are in trouble where I'll send them my little lists of don't talk to so-and-so, do talk to so-and-so, absolutely don't talk to that person because you're going to end up completely misrepresented. They have an agenda, and you are going to be part of that agenda, and it's going to be a disaster. But this person is somebody we're talking to. I think it's time for scientists to consider taking this on as a task and really doing this kind of thing where they can share information with each other and use social media to their own good to figure out which journalists they think are trustworthy and which ones are not. So just to wrap up, and I think we'll have a little bit of time for questions, why bother with the media? Well, as Steve mentioned last night, why bother with the media? Because there are always people doing stuff in the media, and if we don't get good research and good dialogue in terms of people who disagree, leg have legitimate points of disagreement within research, then we basically end up in a situation where only the people willing to do that kind of work end up in the limelight, and that brings it to the public. You may think the media is not that important, but if you think about how you know about anything outside of this room beyond your personal family, the way you know about it is basically through media. Everything you know about what's going on in the Republican nominations, what's going on in Syria, what's going on down the street in terms of a new development from your own home, the way you tend to know about it is because it goes to the media. And so if you want your work to have any social impact at all, chances are it has to go that way. And if you want people to appreciate and want to fund and want to support science, then it's important to do media work because having good science out there, interesting science out there, science where we're clear that science is a process and not a product, will help people understand why so much money gets spent in terms of federal funding on science and maybe that more should be.
Democracy, this is what I argue in the book, that democracy and science are fundamentally intertwined. And I already talked about this a little bit, but if we're going to have a well-functioning democracy, science is critically important. And if you look historically, what you find is actually that a huge percentage, really, of the founding fathers were science geeks. They were interested in the universe. They were interested in plants. They were interested in animals. They were interested in reproduction. They were science geeks. Why? Well, because science and democracy during the Enlightenment actually began with the same values, not coincidentally. They were growing up together as part of the Enlightenment. They both valued the idea of peer review. So in the sciences, the idea was to create scientific societies and journals where there would be a review. Within the democratic system, there was the criminal justice system, which would have a jury, which was essentially peer review. We would have voting, which was essentially peer review. We would have checks and balances through the three branches of government, which is essentially peer review. And so these two things had the same concept behind them, namely the idea that crowdsourcing would get you better knowledge and ultimately lead to a better life. So the founding fathers understood that democracy and science are fundamentally intertwined. And what I would say to you is that when the pursuit of truth, which is science, is harmed, the pursuit for justice is also harmed. And when we don't have a just system that treats people who are doing the pursuit of truth well, then what we end up with is a system where Justice is also harmed back. So justice and truth depend on each other, and they have to work integratively together. And for you to understand that means for you to understand that in order to engage in this larger picture, it means sometimes having to put up with the media. Thank you. That was incredibly helpful. Lots Thank of you. practical advice, um, which all of us <laughs> would be wise to consider. My question is this. You focused on how to represent your own research, your uh, particular publication, perhaps, or your record. What about, as in intelligence and other fields, there is sort of a backlog of what my colleague Robert Gordon calls falsisms. And any study you publish comes up against this wall of falsisms, uh, falsehoods that have been accepted as proven truths. Um, a number of us have been talking about, well, how do you deal with that? Um, do you have, because it goes beyond a single person, but it affects all of us. Any particular suggestions on that? I recognize this can be hard to deal with because funding systems aren't interested in having you write that kind of paper, right? The kind of paper that says, here are all these falsisms, because what they're interested in is novel research, not something that looks back and says, here's this problem where this idea has been replicated, even though it's not well supported by the evidence. So I think what I would say is that it probably has to often come to the senior people in the field to do that kind of work and to come together. I know you're really busy, but you can do it collaboratively with, uh, with students to do it. And I think part of what you have to do is very specifically engage the journal editors directly. Don't do it by email. Have a phone call and say, we're facing a problem where something that we think in the field is really inaccurate keeps being replicated. Talk to us about what kind of paper you would like to see that might actually make a dent in this. And journal editors actually have a lot more knowledge than we often give them credit for in terms of how to position work so that we can begin to chip away at the stuff that has been wrong that has built up over time. Can I follow that up? Because sometimes when editors are very prompt, mm -hmm. Yes, so sometimes the editors are the problem because they don't want the journal. Yes, I think you're absolutely right. And you have to do it anyway. And I know it's hard and it's difficult and you have to press. But as much as possible, I think you have to try to do that work. And if it would help working with a journalist to try to correct that error, that can often work. So, you know, I thought that when I started off doing intersex rights work within the patient system, that if I published some stuff in some medical ethics journals, the medical system would change. And then I thought, no, I have to publish it in the medical journals, and that will change. No. You know what changed it? Going on NBC, going on Oprah, that is what started to change it. Because people who are scientists and physicians and policymakers, they're getting their information from the media. They're not reading that much in terms of the actual literature within the sciences. And so as a consequence, sometimes what you have to do if there's a really big error is try as much as possible to go high up and t tackle it on every level you possibly can. 
but I know it can be really difficult. Within history of medicine, for example, there are some myths within the history of medicine that we fight over and over. And, for example, the myth that the reason the cholera epidemic ended was because Jon Snow took the handle off the pump. The epidemic, in fact, had already started to abate before he took the handle off the pump. Snow was right, but the story is wrong. And yet it is so difficult sometimes when a wrong story or wrong idea is out there, and all you can do is push and push and push. And I know it's frustrating. That's part of being a scholar. Thank you again. Uh, it seems to me that journalists are used to talking to people like politicians and celebrities who are very extroverted and used to just throwing things out there, where in the research community we trend a little more introverted and reflective. How can we politely ask them to give us time to reflect when, we're, when they're talking with us or to, to send us an email with questions and so forth? Usually they get in touch with you by email, and so one of the things you can do is write back and say, I often do, can you give me a sense of what you want to talk about and what the questions might be so that I can give you the best answer possible? I often say, I tend to be very long-winded and I don't want to waste your time. So please send me a note about what I should, and I'll have concise answers ready for you that way. And they like that because I'm not going to waste their time, so they often respond and they say, here are the questions. Now, there'll be additional questions when we're on the phone together, and often it'll wander off. But if you're wandering off into somewhere you're not comfortable with, you can always say, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, I forgot I have a meeting I have to go to. Send me a follow-up and I'll follow up. I've done that more times than I can count. I, my son always calls me on the phone urgently from school when there's a reporter on that I'm having trouble with. <laughs> His timing is remarkable, and I always have to hang up and take his call. <sighs> so you can do that. You can, you can take your time. You are not obligated to be precisely on the very moment they need you. Follow up quickly, because you don't want to get them to go ahead without you. But you can do that. You can have more control on this than you think. And that's part of media training, is learning how to keep control of the conversation. Alice, you mentioned that uh, your dean had articles that you had published withdrawn. Were these peer-reviewed publications? Uh, that, that sounds horrific. I mean, how, how does that happen? It was horrific, and I, I fought it for 18 months before I gave up and resigned. Uh, this was a journal put out by my department, which was Medical Humanities and Bioethics at the Feinberg School of Medicine in Northwestern. And we had an annual journal that the, um, we put out. We were the editors of it called Atrium. And it was an international journal where we would put out a, theme, a call for a particular theme. So some of the themes were things like power, liminality. In the case that I was given, I was, became the editor of the 2014 issue. The topic was bad girls, which everybody said I should do because <laughs> it was a good sort of feminist provocative thing. So I sent out the call for proposals that the faculty put together, as we always did. We put together a call for proposals, sent it out. I got about 35 proposals back. Out of those, I was able to pick 13 for the length that we have. These are short essay articles, often with a few footnotes, written sort of pensively on the question of medicine and how medicine and medical research work. But they're written largely by doctors, uh, nurses within academic systems, and then mostly by people in the medical humanities and bioethics, so medical history, literature and medicine, philosophy of medicine. And um, one of the articles that I published was a piece by cultural anthropologist Bill Peace at Syracuse University. And in that piece, he was talking about his own experience as a man who was disabled and sexuality. And what he was writing about was how in 1978, because of a congenital problem, he became paralyzed from the waist down. And he was in a long-term rehabilitation facility, which they tend not to be like this anymore, where you got to know the people around you, you had peer support for months on end, and you also got to know the caregivers very well. And the doctor, he was 18 years old, newly spinal cord injured. He didn't know if he could have a sex life. And the doctors refused to answer his questions or couldn't answer his questions. And he was very anxious about this. And so he tells the story of how one night after he had lost bladder control and he was crying, a nurse that he knew very well and who at that point was friends with him came to him and reassured him by providing him oral sex. And that this had gave him sort of a sense that he was going to be okay. It was a mutually consensual act. And Bill was not advocating we should do this in hospitals today. He referred to this period as the Wild West of rehabilitation medicine. It was, the sexual rehabil it, was, it was the sexual revolution. People were doing a lot of drugs. It really was the Wild West. But what he was trying to raise the question about was, why is it still today we don't adequately address the questions that newly injured people have about their sexual lives? 
So this was published along with a lot of other hot stuff. I had a piece on transgenderism in Samoa. I had several pieces on abortion. I had one piece about how women, women who don't want to be caregivers, which is a very culturally disruptive concept that a woman doesn't want to be a caregiver to her mother or to her children. I had pieces on women with disability and their sexuality being denied to them. And so when the deans, this went out, 3,000 copies, high gloss, lovely production we do, and it also went up online. And when the dean uh, saw it, he got so upset with Bill Peace's article, he gave an order to pull it. Now, he couldn't pull back the paper copies, but he could give the order to take off, down, offline what, it, what Bill had published, and they did that. And um, what had happened, the backdrop of this, is about a year and a half earlier, our medical school signed a branding agreement with the hospital and basically sold the medical school for the large part to the hospital. And so rather than being clearly a normal part of a university, we got subsumed under a hospital corporation that proceeded to have all sorts of new rules about budgeting and what we were allowed to say and what our brand was and which color purple we're supposed to use and all of the rest of it. And so the dean did this, and I was astonished. I was finishing a book on academic freedom, right? I was like, this is bizarre. I thought Penguin was pulling a publicity stunt on me, actually. It was so bizarre. And so I, I thought it would end, and people said, stay quiet, Alice. Don't freak out. Like, we'll fix it. And for months they tried, and one of my other colleagues ended up resigning over it in December. Christy Kirshner, who's a physician who does rehabilitation medicine, resigned over the same thing. I went back into the dean's office angry. I said, look, I have a book that is coming out in March. It is blurbed by Steven Pinker, Jared Diamond, E.O. Wilson, Dan Savage, Elizabeth Loft. This is going to be a big book. And it's about academic freedom. And I'm not good at being a hypocrite, and I'm really bad at keeping my mouth shut. <laughs> I've kept my mouth shut for months. Put it back. And they said, congratulations on your book. And that was it. So months later, I met with the provost, and I said, put it back. Don't put me in this position. And they didn't. And so finally, a month later, in May of this year, Bill Peace and I said, we've had it. This was 15 months into the censorship. We said, we've had it. We're going public. And they said, OK, put it back. So I said, you know, Galileo's middle finger to you, and went public anyway. <laughs> And then continued to try, and they did not put it back. And I told my provost, I need a clear statement from you saying you understand censorship occurred, and you're guaranteeing me it won't happen again, or I can't work at this university, because the work I do is so high risk. People have always gotten upset about my work. I have so many people angry at me. My husband has a list that if I get killed, which people they should check. But it's so long, <laughs> it would take the entire police academy. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? They wouldn't do that. So on August 24th, I send in my resignation effective September 1st. And now I don't work at a university. I'm do and people ask me, what am I doing? I'm doing all the same work. I'm here, right? I'm doing all the same work. I just don't work for a university. And by the way, I should mention, I gave up uh, full-time work years ago because I was doing patient advocacy, mainstream writing, and also raising a kid. And so in 2004, I gave up tenure and decided to go part-time. And my job at Northwestern was 20%. But I was a full professor with a Guggenheim Fellowship. Most people thought I was 100%, but I wasn't. So I'm now, I've lost that 20% income, which I make up in other ways. Uh, I've lost the university affiliation, which was a prestigious affiliation, but I think I've made it so that it's not such a prestigious affiliation anymore. <laughs> you know, something you said about going on Oprah makes me feel much better about some things that some of us did early in the days of the race IQ controversy. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up appearing on Oprah's show uh, in the television uh, recording phase, but the episode was never broadcast. Because you were um, too reasonable? But, huh? Because you were too reasonable? I don't think they thought I was reasonable, but I was... <laughs> I, 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 I thought I was. But I appeared on Sally Jesse Raphael. Uh, Mike Levin, who was a philosophy professor at CCNY in those days, appeared on a circuit of shows that were controversy-oriented in the New York City area. And we got a, uh, Phil Rushton also appeared on many of these shows. And we got a lot of flack from colleagues about doing that because they thought we were publicity-seeking, okay? And I don't think, I can only speak for myself, nothing was further from my mind, but in the back of our minds, we had the message, we had the notion of getting out in front of a large audience the idea that there was an issue here, that the opinion was not monolithic altogether on the wrong side. And uh, what you said just makes me feel that our intuitions 
were not wrong. Yes, and, and you're right. You will take crap from your colleagues if you're in the media a lot. It causes professional jealousy. One of the ways to deal with that is to back off sometimes and to say, you know, I've been interviewed a lot. I think it's important to get a diversity of voices out there and recommend another colleague. And I do that frequently on topics where I've been interviewed a lot where I'll say, I think you should talk to so-and-so. But then I have to be driven crazy, right, because my colleagues don't get it quite right like I would. <laughs> so I do think it's important to do that work. Yes, you will take crap from your colleagues. About it. My whole lesson, really, today is to tell you this is difficult and hard, and there's no easy way to do it, and you will take crap from every side, and I want you to do it anyway. That's what I do every day. Is it's difficult and it's hard and it's crap, and I do it every day anyway. Why? Because I really think that, that scholarship is how we got to where we are today in terms of our freedoms, and that scholarship is good in and of itself. So I don't want to discourage you, but it's often difficult. Alice, you've worked very effectively at the intersection between journalism and, and science. Um, obviously more effectively than most of us are able to, partly because you've embraced it and built talks like this that, uh, that, that show your expertise there. Um, I know many people, I may be one of them, I won't judge that, but I know many people who I would judge should not interact with journalists, <laughs> but should spend all of their time doing science because they're spectacular scientists, and they're not by either temperament or personality or, for that matter, uh, uh, epistemology, people who work well with journalists. Um, your talk today has been to all of us as though we all need to and should interact with journalists. Uh, I'd like you to reflect on, uh, on those of us who, who may not be the kind of people who should interact with journalists, uh, whether you agree with that um, and, um, and how, well, I'm especially intrigued by something you said earlier in your talk about how uh, there was an advocate for a university that stepped forward. That seems like universities should have dozens of those hired and in place on a regular basis. I was wondering how we could institutionalize that. In any, any case, could you work a little bit on, on those issues? Sure. There, it's definitely the case, I think, that some people shouldn't work with journalists because they just don't have the skill set to do it. And in those cases, if those people's work is coming before the media, it's especially important that they get a media relations person to do that work for them or to accompany them or to help them with press releases and do things in writing instead of do them in terms of speaking. Steve Pinker yesterday was trying to, I think, encourage you heavily to write in the mainstream. I don't think a lot of you should do that. I think your best and highest use is actually doing science. And um, if you want to do that, I think that's great. But you can often do better work by doing the science and let the science writing, as we call it, happen with other people. Um, how do you get advocates within university systems or institutions? You have to do it yourself, start it, and work with other people, other scientists to get it. But if you do as a group basically petition the administration and say, we don't have enough media relations people to help us, and you can evidence that by saying, I'm calling on media relations people, but they're super busy with this story and this story and this story, you can sometimes get more people, and the media relations people will help you with that because they want to have the jobs and they want to have more of them. Universities, can, you, can, you can work through academic systems, governance systems, to try to get more assistance. In general, what will happen at universities, today especially, is everybody within media relations, legal, everything else, they work for the administration, not for you. But if you can convince the administration that helping you is in the best interest of the administration, then they will help you. So for 10 years, the media relations people at Northwestern helped me intensely. Even though I'm a pro, they would help me field when there was, for example, a really busy time. They would triage incoming calls. We would do practice together. And the reason they were able to do that was because the administration could see that I was doing high-profile work that made the university look good. Obviously, that changed when the resignation was coming. I couldn't call on them and say, can I get your help with this? They didn't turn on me, which was lovely, I think because we had good relationships. Uh, I thought they were going to, these nice people were going to turn on me. But basically, you can go to them, take them to lunch, have a coffee with them, meet them in their office, whatever, explain to them what you do, and say, I think I'm probably bad at doing this, and I think a lot of scientists probably are, but how do we get your help? And bring them into the research lab spaces to come talk to you. We, for example, in our program, had media relations people come into our graduate program and talk to our students about how do you work with a media relations person. But how often in a graduate training program do you ever bother to do that? It's actually, I think, worth doing, bringing in one of those people who can help educate your graduate students about how to do that kind of work with a media relations person. So it's more available than you think. It's like all sorts of government programs. They exist, you just don't know about them. 
Within your own university, there are resources that exist to deal with this stuff that you just don't know about. Well, Dr. Dreger, I, I thank you so much thank for a wonderful presentation. I know you have to get to the Yes, airport, I do have to so. get my plane. Thank you so much. Thank you.